Good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock and I can see that participants are uh, joining away. So we're gonna give it another minute to allow a few more people to join us and then we'll get started. And a minute's a long time when you're sitting here trying not to say anything. <laughs> All right, 12.01, let's get started. Good afternoon, I'm Peg Breen, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. It's my pleasure to welcome you to another virtual walking tour of the city's terrific historic areas. Len Umberger, our architectural historian and manager of special projects is an engaging guide and I always learn new things listening to him. The weather is about encouraging us to go on our own explorations outside today. And I bet today's talk will inspire us to take a new look at Madison Square. Please put your questions into the chat room and Glenn will answer as many as possible after he concludes. And now, Glenn, take it away. Thank you, Peg. Madison Square is one of my favorite city parks. Named for our country's fourth president, this six acre park, which legally opened to the public in 1844, was described in 1902 as the center of the world of amusement and fashion in the city with fine shade trees, a fountain. And in summer, it is a pleasant and favorite place with residents and strangers staying in the vicinity to smoke a cigar in. While during the day, it is generally overrun by children and their nurses. Today, Madison Square typically will attract thousands of visitors every day, but unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we can't take our usual walking tour this afternoon. So instead, I would like to share with you my top 10 hidden secrets of Madison Square. Secret number one, a road ran through it. If we could step back in time to 1815, just after the commissioners finished their Herculean work laying out Manhattan's famous orthogonal street grid. And if we were traveling north along the Bloomingdale Road or Broadway, we would come to a fork in the road about where the Flatiron Building is today. Bloomingdale Road would continue off to our left in a northwesterly direction, but to our right in a northeasterly direction we would find the Eastern or Boston Post Road. Crossing what would later become Madison Square, the Post Road, the remnants of which are highlighted here in blue on this map from 1879, continued northerly through the island of Manhattan, through what would later become Central Park around East 97th Street, and then up through the Bronx and out to Westchester County. Now, as the name implies, the road terminated in the city of Boston, Massachusetts, after traveling through Connecticut and Rhode Island. It was New York City's link to the outside world to the north and would later become part of US-1, the one of the first major highways in the United States. And it started here at Madison Square. Secret number two, the three-sided square. So before you think I was asleep during my high school geometry class and I didn't learn the difference between these two basic shapes, and yes, Mr. Yost, I was indeed awake and paying attention, there is a square, or in this case, a city park, bounded by three streets, Fifth Avenue, West 25th Street, and Broadway. Most tourists miss seeing it because they are focused on taking their selfies with the Flatiron Building, and most locals overlook it because in recent years, it has become a bit of a pedestrian no man's land. But there is here something really worth taking time to go and see. And I'll tease you with this photograph from 1910. Now, the first thing you'll notice is a 51 foot tall gray Quincy granite obelisk 
which was designed by James Goodwin Batterson, a co-owner of the New England Granite Works of Hartford, Connecticut. It commemorates the life of Major General William Jenkins Worth, who valiantly served in the War of 1812, the Second Seminole War, during which he was made a general, and later in the Mexican-American War, when he was elevated to the rank of Major General. Worth died of cholera in Texas at the age of 55. Perhaps you've never heard of the general, but he is the namesake of Fort Worth, Texas, Lake Worth in Florida, and Worth Street, which runs across Manhattan from Tribeca to Chinatown. The monument is noteworthy as being the second oldest monument in a New York City park. The oldest is the 1856 George Washington Equestrian down at Union Square. And as a military monument, there are several outstanding sculptural elements I want to point out. And I'll start with this one. This is a bronze cartouche depicting flags, arrows, cannon, and a suit of armor, along with an American bald eagle perched atop a sphere with the coat of arms of the city and state of New York trimmed by oak and laurel branches. Here's a bronze laurel wreath with a sword. Look closely and you'll see the word Monterey inscribed on the ribbon, a reference to the Battle of Monterey from the Mexican-American War. The granite stars are awful, also rather fantastic. And the cast iron fence, now missing the corner gas lampposts, it has wonderful details, including these swords embellished with oak leaves and acorns. It is actually a replica of Major General Worth's Congressional Sword of Honor, which he was awarded in 1847. And here is your Latin lesson for the day, Ducet Amor Patriae. I will leave it to you to provide the proper English translation. But here's the secret. Not only is it a rather interesting monument, it is also worth gravesite, giving it the distinction of being one of only two private mausolea located on public grounds in the city of New York. The other, since you may be asking, is Grant's tomb in Riverside Park. Secret number three, the Admiral. Now, I should point out here that before the 1860s, the United States Navy did not have the rank of admiral. That changed with David Glasgow Farragut, who served in the Union forces during the United States Civil War, and notably during the Battle of Mobile Bay in August 1864, famously commanded, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, or something to that effect. Farragut's heroics eventually led him to be elevated to a newly created rank of admiral. Shortly after Farragut's death in 1870, the Farragut Memorial Association began planning a public monument, and it was an ambitious undertaking. And according to the New York Times, it was intended that the monument shall be worthy of a great naval hero. The commission was awarded not to an established artist, but to a then 28-year-old American working in Paris by the name of Augustus St. Gaudens, whose birthday was March 1st, which coincidentally was also the birthday of Major General Worth. For St. Gaudens, however, the Farragut Memorial was his first substantial commission as a professional sculptor. The result was a monument with an eight foot three inch bronze figure of the Admiral by St. Gaudens set on a base of North River Bluestone that was designed by a then relatively unknown young New York architect by the name of Stanford White. White designed a central plinth seven feet high with an excedra extending eight feet four inches to the left and to the right. And at either side, St. Gaudens created two bas-relief allegorical figures. Loyalty appears on the left and courage on the right. Completed in 1881, more than a decade in the making, the monument was installed in the northwest corner of Madison Square facing Worth Square across Fifth Avenue on a spot personally selected by Stanford White himself. On Memorial Day, Wednesday, May 25th, the monument was officially dedicated, and as was the common practice of the day, a cornerstone had been laid in the Masonic tradition, complete with a time capsule containing newspapers, 
a collection of Farragut's correspondence and newly minted US coins. In 1902, Appleton's Dictionary of New York, a complete guidebook to the city and vicinity, noted that the Farragut Monument was the most admired of the city's collection as a work of art. Unfortunately, by the turn of the last century, the North River Bluestone Base had already begun to deteriorate. And in 1934, the city of New York had it replicated in a more durable black granite. The original was then relocated to the St. Gaudens National Historic Site in New Hampshire, where it remains on display today, complete with a recasting of Gaudens' heroic Admiral Farragut. Now, since I'd like to give homework during my tours, today's assignment is to visit the Farragut Monument in its present day location at the north end of Madison Square and see if you can locate the decapod crustacean. Secret number four, Diana. Perhaps the most famous building ever erected on Madison Square was Madison Square Garden or if we wanted to be a bit more accurate, the second Madison Square Garden by McKim, Mead and White, seen here about 1900. But I want you to focus on the garden soaring 347 foot tall tower with its loges, belvedere's and diaper pattern brickwork, and more precisely the copper weather vane that topped it all off. Known as Diana of the Crosswinds, the 18 foot tall sculpture was the work of Augustus St. Gaudens, who you'll recall worked with Stanford White on the nearby Farragut Monument. Cast into thin copper sheets and gilded with fine gold at the W.H. Mullins Company in Salem, Ohio, Diana, the Roman virgin goddess of the hunt, wild animals, fertility, and the moon, arrived in Manhattan by train on Monday, September 28, 1891, and was installed on her perch on Saturday, October 3rd. She was officially unveiled to much fanfare on Sunday, November 1st. However, Diana, the weather vane, had three major design defects, the most prominent of which being that she was simply too tall. Less than a year after arriving in New York, Diana quietly went missing on Monday, September 12, 1892. The New York Times, in reporting on her disappearance, quoted Cicero, Diana has left, absconded, escaped, and disappeared. Unbeknownst to most New Yorkers, Diana didn't vanish into thin air, but was bound for a new destination in Chicago, where she reappeared atop McKim Mead and White's Agricultural Building, one of the famed White City structures constructed for the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. But St. Gaudens had already begun work when a reincarnated Diana in the spring of 1892, while the first Diana was still posed in place atop her tower, her arrow pointing into the ever-changing winds. On Wednesday, November 1st, 1893, two years after her predecessor was unveiled, the new and improved and shorter 13-foot Diana arrived in New York, having made the same journey from Ohio by train. Stanford White acknowledged that the figure is practically the same in idea as the old one, but it is entirely different in poise and proportion. The nearly $6,000 cost to, to replace Diana of the Crosswinds was personally paid for by Stanford White and Augustus St. Gaudens. One contemporary art critic noted, the little goddess now has movement and elasticity as well as dignity there's more strength in her limbs than there was, and there is more grace. Unfortunately, as you know, Madison Square Garden was never really a successful business enterprise, and the building was demolished in the spring of 1925. The end for Diana came at 2.56 p.m. on Wednesday, May 6th of that year, when she was unceremoniously lowered from her perch and relegated to a storage locker at the Franklin Fireproof Warehouse on Rockville Place in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. She would remain in seclusion until 1932, where she was offered a new permanent home, not in New York, but 97 miles to the south, in the then new Philadelphia Museum of Art, 
where she was enshrined on a balcony of the Great Stair Hall. In 2013, Diana underwent a makeover and was regilded in 100 square feet of matted 23.4 karat red gold to the original specifications of Sanford White and Augusta St. Gaudens. Secret number five, Leonard Walter Jerome. If I were to ask you to name the King of Wall Street, I doubt very much I would hear the name of Leonard Jerome. But if I had asked the same question to an average New Yorker in the 1850s, I'm surely I would have heard the response of Leonard Jerome. Mr. Jerome was a descendant of an 18th century French Huguenot immigrant. And he was known as a flamboyant stock speculator, hardly in keeping with his ancestry, who had a talent for amassing and then losing immense fortunes down at the corner of Wall and Broad. At one time, his wealth was estimated at $10 million, when most Americans barely earned $500 a year. As a sign of his, of his position in New York society, Jerome hired architect Thomas R. Jackson in 1859 to build a six-story mansion for the southeast corner of East 26th Street and Madison Avenue. Completed in 1865 at an astounding cost of $200,000, the Jerome Mansion featured a ballroom with champagne dispensing fountains, a 600-seat opera theater, a dining room for 100 guests, a breakfast room with seating for 70, and an elegant carriage house featuring exotic wood paneling and stained glass windows. Jerome's eldest daughter, Jenny, later became Lady Randolph Churchill, the mother of former British Prime Minister, Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill. And that's the young Winston on the right with his mother and young brother, Jack. Churchill once quipped that his maternal American grandfather was very fierce, adding that, I'm the only tame one they've produced. Leonard Jerome's fortunes and his ownership of the mansion on Madison Square changed dramatically after the September 1869 Black Friday gold panic. The resulting financial disaster forced Jerome to vacate the mansion, which was first rented to the Union League Club as their second clubhouse. It was there that a meeting was held in November of 1869 that created the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In later years, the mansion was home to the University Club and then the Manhattan Club, which sold the building for a mere $600,000 in 1965 to a developer, the same year that the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission designated it an, an individual landmark. But after a two-year effort to save the mansion, it was demolished in 1967. Today, it is the site of the non-landmarked 576 foot tall New York Merchandise Mark building by Emery Roth and Sons. Secret number six, the Temple of Justice. Just next door is the home of the appellate division of the New York Supreme Court First Department. The courthouse was designed by James Brown Lord, and this is certainly is most certainly his masterpiece. Opening in 1900, this classically inspired Palladian three-story building was constructed of Dover marble and cost about $700,000 for construction. About one quarter of that was spent on the exterior sculptural program. And it really is the sculptures that make this such an architectural gem. And if you've never stopped to take a look, you really should. For example, here is Force by Frederick Ruckstall, flanking the right side of the East 25th Street entrance, along with Ruckstall's companion, Wisdom, located on the opposite side. On the Madison Avenue elevation at the attic level are four caryatids, the female figures used as supporting columns by Thomas Shields Clark. These represent the Four Seasons, above which is Peace by Carl Bittner. You may also notice the standing figures at the cornice. These are famous lawgivers from history. And here's Confucius on the left and Moses. 
the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission designated the courthouse as an individual landmark in June of 1966, and later designated the courthouse as an interior landmark in October 1981. Secret number seven, Madison Square Presbyterian Church. In the mid 19th century, the blocks surrounding Madison Square, seen here highlighted in green, hosted several grand houses of worship, including an, an Episcopal church, a Baptist church, a Methodist church, and a Presbyterian church. Of these original four congregations, the Presbyterians occupied the most visually prominent location on a lot directly facing the square. When the congregation was, early, was organized in early 1853, they hired the architect, Richard M. Upjohn, son of the famous British-born architect, Richard Upjohn. The younger Upjohn had just joined his father's firm in 1853, and the commission for the new Madison Square Presbyterian Church was his first individual design project. When the building was finished, at a cost of $175,000, the spire remained the tallest structure in the neighborhood for the next four decades. In 1893, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, the church's next door neighbor directly to the south, decided to construct this 11-story full block headquarters building. With the Met Life development, the church's leadership decried that they were becoming increasingly restive under the growing encroachment of our neighbors' building operations. For while we could not deny the elegance of the structure they were erecting, it nonetheless, nonetheless on that account excluded what we consider our fair share of light and air, and by force of contrast, practically destroyed the architectural grace and dignity of our church. On Monday, February 3rd, 1903, the Reverend Dr. Charles H. Parkhurst, the senior minister and his congregation sold their building to the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company for the sum of $325,000 in cash and the conveyance of the corner lot directly across East 24th Street, where they would set out to construct a new church building. Secret number eight the tallest building in the world. Once the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company took possession of the now former Presbyterian Church building on the southeast corner of East 24th Street and Madison Avenue, they quickly went to work on constructing a new headquarters building. But not just any building would do. They wanted it to be the tallest building in the world. At that time, the title was being held by the Singer Building at 149 Broadway, on the northwest corner at Liberty Street. Designed by Ernest Flagg, the Singer Building had just been completed in 1908. For their new building on Madison Square, seen here on the far left in this photograph from around 1915, MetLife chose Napoleon Lebrun and Sons as their architects, who drew their inspiration from the Campanile three years after MetLife's new building was opened for business. At 700 feet tall, it was the tallest building in the world, a title it would hold until the Chrysler building topped it in 1930. But the secret here is the clock, or actually four different clocks, one on each side of the tower. Measuring 26 and a half feet in diameter, they are six inches wider than the ones at Philadelphia City Hall, which previously had been the world's tallest building from 1894 until 1908. But to give you a sense of scale here at Madison Square, the minute hands of the four clocks at MetLife each weigh 1,000 pounds. The clock tower was renovated in the early 1960s and the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission designated it an individual landmark in 1989. Today, it is an upscale hotel. You can rent the tower rooms for a small price. Secret number nine, Madison Square Presbyterian Church. 
When Dr. Parkhurst and his congregation sold their building and moved across East 24th Street, their new home was a $500,000 edifice designed by McKim, Mead and Waite, seen here with their old Upjohn design building just prior to its demolition. Stanford White's general scheme included elements of which were a bold portico in front, a dome above, the exterior materials to be of brick and terracotta, and columns of marble and granite. What has been considered to be Stanford White's masterpiece was still under construction on the evening of Monday, June 25th, 1906, when White was murdered two blocks away at Madison Square Garden. Originally scheduled for completion in time for Easter Sunday on April 15th, the project was already behind schedule and would not be complete until the autumn, when on Sunday morning, October 14th, at 1114, 11 o'clock a.m., the congregation gathered to dedicate their new building. Dr. Parkhurst dubbed it an ecclesiastical gem in the midst of a commercial setting. Stanford White himself had described the style of architecture as follows. The style of architecture is that of the early Christian with a mod modified Byzantine treatment in the interior. It is to a certain extent a protest against the prevalent idea among laymen that a building to be church-like must be built in medieval style. The style of architecture known as Gothic has nothing to do with the simple forms of early Christian religion or with that of the Reformation or with the style of architecture which prevailed in our own country when it had its birth as a nation. In the design of the Madison Square Presbyterian Church, the chief aim is to treat it as a modern church and in a style natural to and belonging to the religion which it represents and to the country in which it's built. While the new church building was not the tallest on the square like the earlier version, version had been when it was finished, even so, the distinctive color of its ornaments gave it the gravitas it deserved. Unfortunately, it would only occupy its site facing Madison Square for 13 years. On Tuesday, May 6, 1919, the New York Times reported that workmen began yesterday to tear down the Madison Square Presbyterian Church, and its destruction will remove one of the most interesting, as well as the most costly religious edifices in the city. The Times lamented its demolition is a distinct architectural loss to the city. Today, more than 100 years later, David Dunlap reminds us that New York's shortest lived landmark and Stanford White's own favorite building were one and the same, the Madison Square Presbyterian Church. And secret number 10, Roscoe Conklin. If you're not familiar with the name Roscoe Conklin, I won't hold it against you. In fact, I bet very few modern day New Yorkers have even heard of him, but did you know that he has a statue in Madison Square? And here it is. But you may still be asking Roscoe who? Well, Roscoe Conklin was born in Albany in 1829 and trained as a lawyer with his father. He was elected mayor of Utica, New York in 1858 and then was, a, and then was promptly elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1859, where he served except for one two-year term until 1867, at which time he was selected to the United States Senate. Now you'll recall prior to 1913, United States senators were appointed by their respective state legislatures and not elected by popular vote. I'll also mention that Conklin also received 93 votes for the Republican nomination for president at the GOP's 1876 convention in Cincinnati. He lost the nomination to the future president Rutherford B. Hayes. In 1881, Conklin retired from national politics and returned to private life in New York City, where he ran a successful law practice. Now, here's the secret. On Monday, March 12th, 1888, or precisely 133 years ago tomorrow, New York City was hit with the blizzard of 88 that came to be known as the storm of the century or the great white hurricane. Not only did it bring piles of snow, 
It brought death and destruction, and one casually was our friend, Roscoe Conklin. That evening, Conklin, who was a bit impatient to get home, decided to walk from his offices at number 10 Wall Street to his club on Madison Square, a distance of about three miles. Suffering from exposure, Conklin became ill and died at 1.50 p.m. on Wednesday, April 18th at the Hoffman House Hotel, seen here on the corner of 25th and Broadway. And here's a photograph of the expanded Hoffman House Hotel from 1907. You will, of course, recognize Major General Worth's obelisk directly in front of the hotel. Now, five years after Conklin's demise, his friends petitioned the mayor and city parks board for a statue to be erected to commemorate the late politician and lawyer. The city gave its blessing and the commission for the statue went to John Quincy Adams Ward, who created an eight foot, 1200 pound bronze standing figure, which was installed on a granite plinth near the Southeast corner of Madison Square in early December, 1893, without any formal ceremony. Conklin still stands there today, 127 years later, and even with a prominent location, it is perhaps one of the city's most overlooked statues to an historical figure that hardly anyone can identify. So there you have it, my top 10 hidden secrets of Madison Square. Now, the next time you're standing in the queue at Shake Shack for your Shack Burger, crinkle cut fries and vanilla shake, grab your lunch and take a walk around the square and discover some of the other hidden treasures of this wonderful city park. Thank you. And thank you, Glenn. That was terrific as usual. Thank you. Although I had heard of Roscoe, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sure we have uh, questions for you. Alyssa, are you, um, can you help us uh, with that? Yes, um, there are a couple. The first is there's a version of, of the Diana statue at the Met. Did you mention that? Um, I did not mention that. Um, there's actually many versions of Diana. Um, there's study models of Diana, one of which is at the Met. Um, both versions were highly, were very popular with the public. Um, and Augusta St. Gaudens being the um, prolific sculptor and um, businessman that he was, um, made many for sale. Um, he also gave them as gifts. Um, Stanford White had um, a personal copy. Um, there's also a copy um, at Stanford White's Summer House, Box Hill, out in Long Island. Um, recently, one came up for sale at Christie's in New York. Um, I went to see it in the, the showroom. Um, I forget what it went for. Um, but yes, there's, there's many versions of Diana um, around. Wasn't there kind of a scandal about having a nude woman on top of the Madison yes. Square Garden to begin with? Yeah. Yes, there was, there was a bit of a scandal. Um, most people didn't realize at the time that she was a nude. Um, and then they got wind of it and um, it was a brief scandal um, that quickly, shall we say, blew over. Okay, uh, next question is, you certainly make the point of the dismal representation of statues of women. Are there any historical points about human women regarding the park? Um, women statues in the park, is that what they're asking? Well, they're just saying that there's obviously a lot of, of statues of men, but is there any histor history behind the park regarding any women? Uh, no, not that I can think of. No. Okay, the next question is, was the old Madison Square Garden off the square? Um, it was actually on the corner. Um, that's the, the northeast corner of the square um, across um, Madison Avenue at that, that corner. Um, it's where the New York Life Building is today. Um, that was the, the location of Madison Square Garden and it took up the whole um, block. Great. Um, then a couple of comments, so informative. Thank you, especially love learning about Diana. Um, another thank you for you. Um, next is, and I'll, excuse me, because I'm probably going to 
butcher this, but was the far far Farragut? Oh, Farragut. Yep, statue moved and why? Um, it was actually moved twice. Um, the first time they moved it um, because they were widening Fifth Avenue and um, it was in the way. Um, and then they moved it again um, to its present location on the north side of the park. Um, it actually has a, um, a different, um, more protected view um, inside the square now. So yes, he got, he got moved twice. The next question is, what led, the, what led to the Stanford White Church being demolished after only 13 years? Did the church sell the property? Yes, so the church sold the property um, for $500,000. So the real estate deal was a wash. Um, poor real estate investment, you know, in 13 years, you make zero dollars. Um, but they, they got out what they put in, which they were happy about. Um, unfortunately, in that 13 years, the neighborhood changed so rapidly um, that none of the parishioners were, were living close to the building anymore. And they decided just to cut their losses and take the money and move uptown. Um, the congregation doesn't exist anymore. They merge into another um, Presbyterian church. Um, so unfortunately, the, the building was, was lost. Um, so, I was going to sorry. say, Glenn, but that really struck me. I mean, what an incredible building to last thir only 13 years. Yes. And so how, just how the cost... Yeah, just the cost alone is staggering. $500,000 at the turn of the last century was, you know, an exorbitant amount of money. Um, they basically didn't really have a budget. Um, you know, they, they spent their money well. Um, and um, fortunately, some of the pieces of the building survive. So unfortunately, we don't have color photography from 1906, but the columns out in front of the church building um, or a green granite column, um, which are fantastic. Um, they were salvaged and now live at a building in Hartford, Connecticut, which was the old Hartford News Building. Um, so they were salvaged um, and moved up there. Um, there's several pieces of the terracotta um, that survive. Um, the image I used of the dove um, I took from Box Hill. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the brickwork from the front entrance is also on that building in Hartford, um, but most of it ended up in landfill. Great. Um, the next question is, has the um, Farragut Times capsule ever been opened? No, I think what happened to it, and I haven't been able to prove this definitively yet, when they moved it the first time, um, it went missing, um, but um, to my knowledge, it was never opened after it was originally installed. But um, my working theory is they they lost it when they moved the the, the statue the first time, um, and it's it's certainly gone. The next question is: the crustacean is a bronze crab that Saint Gaudens and White signed. Why a crab was that typical? Um, I think I am going to leave that as part of the homework assignment. <laughs> um, it's a great question, but I, um, I think I'm going to leave that as the homework, as part of the homework assignment. Um, is it true that Danny Meyer and others helped to bring Madison, Madison Square Park back to its old luster? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and the park today looks fantastic. Um, except for the fact that, you know, it's, you know, in the middle of a pandemic and it's not as full of people as it should be. Um, but it's, it's a, it's, like I said, it's one of my favorite of the city parks. Okay. And one more question here. Uh, can you talk about the great Victorian ironwork, planters, fencing, fountains, et cetera? Is it original replacement or restoration? Um, a bit of all of the above. Um, Unfortunately, cast iron um, in this environment doesn't hold up very well. Um, so pieces will always have to be made, replicated, restored. Um, what's original can be um, maintained. Um, but yeah, so all three. 
Great. And uh, someone else, uh, Lloyd is saying he has, oh, here, there's a few more questions. Sorry, I didn't realize okay. there's an option as well as the chat. Um, was the tallest building in the world a bigger deal in those days than it is today or vice versa? Um, I think it was a bigger deal then. Um, and um, to give a, um, I'll try to give you a short answer. The longer answer can be actually found in my master's thesis because I talk about that. Um, but it was a bigger deal because it was, they were building at heights that no one thought possible at the time. Um, most people, you know, were living in a four-story house. Um, they were going to work in an eight-story building. And all of a sudden, you know, they were putting up buildings in excess of 500 feet. Um, and it was staggering. Um, and also the, the building technology was changing. Um, if you look, for example, at Philadelphia City Hall, 548 feet tall, um, it's all masonry. There's no structural steel in the building at all. Um, the clock tower is done in cast iron, but you know, the structure itself is 88.3 million bricks and granite blocks and marble blocks. Um, you know, that's the technology of 1870. Um, Singer building is more what we consider modern skyscraper design, um, but the limit was, you know, just over 600 feet tall. MetLife, 700 feet tall. Um, so the, you know, it was a much bigger deal because two things were working, you know, together: building technology, um, and and also, you know, the ability to to build these, you know, what we would call out of scale um, buildings. Um, so I think that's the short answer to your question. Um, uh, just two more. Okay. Um, uh, Barbara Dow said that there, it was a fabulous presentation and will there be a write-up of this information available? Um, so we're gonna make um, the video, uh, we're gonna send a, a link to the video recording to you tomorrow so you can watch it again. Um, I didn't put anything in, in writing necessarily, but if there's something in particular you want to know more about, you know, certainly let me know. I can share with you um, that information. And one last question. Do you, Glenn, have a favorite year or decade when you think Madison Square was at its architectural best? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> probably in the years that Madison Square, the second Madison Square Presbyterian Church was there. Um, I think it's you know, really interesting when you see the photograph of the two churches side by side across the street, um, you know, um, so that decade or that 13 years, um, there's a lot going on in those two blocks between you know, the MetLife building. Um, there's a lot of construction that goes on next door to Madison Square Presbyterian Church the second version, just north in those blocks. Um, that's probably, you know, in my opinion, be the most interesting time period of Madison Square because so much is going on. Um, and the architecture is just, you know, fantastic. Um, so that would probably be my, if I had to pick my favorite time timeline, that would, that would probably be it. Listen, look, thanks to all of you uh, for joining us today. I think even when Glenn starts his in-person tours, we're gonna continue some virtual tours because we can accommodate so many more people uh, in them. So thank you, Glenn, once again, for all your oh, knowledge and your research. Thank you for joining us. And we'll have another uh, walk in person and uh, virtual uh, before too long. Thank you. Thanks.